Clint, you just returned from another season in the Alaska Range. How'd things go? I did two trips in the Alaska Range this year, and I've been joking that I got really good at playing Scrabble. <laughs> this is Clint Helander, climber, writer, professional shoveler of roofs. He's a good buddy of mine. I've known him for almost 20 years. I've essentially watched Clint develop from a neophyte climber into one of North America's most accomplished mountaineers. He's perhaps most well known for his ascents in the Revelations, a subrange of jagged peaks about 130 miles southwest of Denali. But he's also spent a lot of time in the Alaska Range proper, particularly on and around Mount Hunter. What makes Mount Hunter a special mountain? Well, I think Mount Hunter is special just because of how it's shaped and how it's formed and the fact that it's between 17,000 foot Mount Foraker and 20,000 foot Denali, yet it holds this respect among climbers and alpinists alike that is really unique for a 14,000 foot mountain and especially in the Alaska range. Mount Hunter, or Bagaya, which is its Denina indigenous name, is dwarfed in size by its neighbors, Denali and Foraker. But for what it lacks in verticality, it makes up for in its steepness, complexity, and sheer scale. It's just completely covered in ice on all sides and just has these tumbling seracs that come down. It hovers over Cahiltna Base Camp where you fly in. All these big giant ridges that extend for miles in all directions. Um, I think there's eight ridges and eight faces on them. And it just has this incredible history. It's really a cutting edge mountain and it continues to be a place where people really test themselves today. So if you know anything about Clint, well, you know he's a pretty darn good writer. And part of the reason he's such a good writer is because he's a student of climbing history. The first ascent of, of Mount Hunter in 1954 is, to this day, a crazy story. And it's really unparalleled, and it's kind of a benchmark season that these guys had. Fred Becky. Henry Maybolm and Heinrich Harrer all joined up and they had what is still to this day maybe considered one of the best seasons of climbing in Alaska ever. Henry Maybolm and Fred Becky climbed the northwest ridge of Denali, which is today a classic yet not very often climbed route, but just a, a beautiful line. So that right there is an incredible feat in and of itself. Then they flew out to Fairbanks and they met Heinrich Harrer who was up there hanging out. He was famous for the Iger. And then they just met in Fairbanks and they went and they made the first ascent of Mount Deborah. Right, so wow, two incredible peaks in the period of a couple of weeks. And then they had this idea to go and climb uh, Mount Hunter, which had not been done yet. It was still a first ascent. And they went up there, and not only did they end up ticking off the West Ridge, but they did it in Alpine style. And it was the first time that a mountain of that size had been climbed in Alpine style. So there was some kind of integration of those Alp tactics from Horror and Fred Becky and the Cascades brought up to a giant mountain in the Alaska Range. And to this day, it's still heralded as one of the greatest first ascents ever. There's no doubt that this trio of 1954 first ascents in the Alaska Range were ahead of their time. But it wouldn't be long before more Alpine-style tactics would come to the Alaska Range, and Mount Hunter was right in the thick of it. During the, the 70s and the 80s, people continued to focus on Mount Hunter, first via the ridge lines like the Northeast Ridge, the Southwest Ridge, the South Ridge in 19... 73 is another incredible story. A young John Waterman went up there. Okay, before we go any farther, I want to clarify something. The John Waterman Clint is referring to here, for the most part, we're going to refer to him as Johnny throughout this episode. Because, well, there's another John Waterman who's going to pop up in this story. Yeah, it's kind of complicated. But for now, let's get back to Johnny. He returned in 
1978. He flew in in March, and he completed what is, in all reality, the most audacious, wild, insane solo ascent that's probably ever been done. People can compare, you know, solos of El Cap and stuff like that. That's totally different. But、uh, Waterman flew in. By himself, and for 145 days, he made the first ascent of the Southeast Spur and then traversed the mountain. That's right, 145 days. That's almost half a year solo on Mount Hunter. Yeah,、Holy、it's、shit. without a doubt one of the greatest solo ascents of all time, and he accomplished a feat that will never be replicated. And I really don't think it's got the credit that it deserves. This season, we're going back in time to unlock the history of some of North America's most iconic mountains and routes. Over the years, the mountains of North America have captivated climbers around the world, leading them to the wild arenas of the Canadian Rockies, the North Cascades, the Tetons, the Alaska Range. Their stories are etched on these high alpine walls. Their visions follow lines of cold gray ice. What inspires them? What makes them come back? Who survives? Who suffers? These are the stories that we'll tell on season six of the Fern Line. This is Ridge of Madness, part one. I think the easy route would be to say that this is a story about climbing a ridge on Mount Hunter, but if you dig below the surface, it's a little more complex than that. Maybe even intriguing. The way I see it, this is really more of a story about the people that climbed that ridge on Mount Hunter. One of them, a troubled solo climber who spent a remarkable 145 days making the first ascent of that ridge and the first complete traverse of the mountain. On the flip side, you had a team of three young friends who believed that they could climb the ridge alpine style and traverse the mountain in seven days. Of course, the climb took them 13 days, but they eventually made it down, frostbitten but alive. As starkly different as these experiences were, there were also parallels. Both climbs pushed their respective members to the edges of human endurance, where the line between life and death is perilously thin. Both climbs attracted notoriety, but where three of the climbers eventually found happiness and success, another found infamy and loneliness. One of the climbers would go on to write a book about the harrowing experience. Another would go on to become one of the world's foremost high-altitude guides. Another would help create one of the outdoor industry's most successful companies, and finally, one would push himself to the brink of madness, only to disappear. Under the cold, dark shadow of Denali, it's hard to know exactly where and when this story begins. But I think a good place to start is probably the early 1970s. Climbing was a lot less trendy. It was less popular、uh, because it was still, you know, very much in the era of trad climbing. This is climber, author, and photographer Glenn Randall. You know, it was before sport climbing and before climbing gyms. And so standards were not skyrocketing at the same rate they are today, and I think it was also because it was more committing and potentially more dangerous. You know, having to place all your own pro, and there's you know the risk of things pulling out. You know, as opposed to just clipping some fat bolt. It was the perfect way post sixties. This is world-renowned high-altitude mountain guide Pete Athens. I think to express the need in a more natural way, being outside of freedom and wanting to wanting to see the world, wanting to see. What climbing would recommend, and then to test ourselves. And since it wasn't mainstream, you got a, a more Art Varkian, James Dean individual into this. And this is Peter Metcalf, a prolific climber from the seventies and eighties. He also co-founded Black Diamond in nineteen eighty-nine. And so it had a very strong non-mainstream iconoclastic culture to it, and that culture was self. Building because if you aren't like that, <laughs> you aren't going to be part of this group of dirtbag 
people are kind of risking their lives. Climbing was so much different in the 1970s than it is today. Obviously, the technology, gear, and standards were a far cry from where things are at now. Plus, there were no cell phones, computers, or social media. Climbers basically met each other by going climbing. Certainly back then, people were accessible. I mean, when I grew up in New York, going up to the Schwangunks, I mean, you'd see people like Henry Barber, you'd see people who were pushing all the limits at that time, and they were all just living the same way you you were. They were throwing their sleeping bag in the dirt on the carriage road. And just uh, everyone was, was uh, it was just uh, a real egalitarian sort of sport in, in those days. You know, the culture at the time, as Pete said, like at the Gunks, when you were there, which was where I was getting introduced to climbing, is that the people who would take you climbing, they were all talking about like, yeah, I mean, the Gunks is great in the fall and spring, but in the summer, it's stinking hot and humid here. You don't want to come here. You want to go to Canada. You want to go to the Tetons. You want to go to the Wind Rivers. You want to do something else. And in the winter, hey, this is what you do. You're going to go up to New Hampshire or you're going to go ice climbing and do this or that. And so that, the books that people were talking about, I chose to climb, the hard years, one man's mountain. We were all reading the same literature. We all had the same heroes. And these people were all still alive, but it was, this is what you do. The storytelling that was always a big part of whatever you, you took part in, wherever you were, whether that was the gunks of Yosemite or Boulder or wherever you wherever you managed to be. So it, uh, you know, those were, there were a lot of stories shared around campfires. There were a lot of stories that, you know, were, were published that we all enjoyed, just the, the culture of sharing. Climbers in the 1970s were known for advancing the craft of free climbing, but there was also a growing shift of taking the skills learned in the gunks and the walls of Yosemite to the alpine arenas of the Alps, the Canadian Rockies, and the monolithic mountains of Alaska. You know, it just seemed logical. You know, you start out rock climbing, and well, then winter comes around, and the rock climbs are not really very available. And so he started, you know, climbing uh, ice, you know, just waterfalls. And then it's like, well, let's take those skills into Rocky Mountain National Park in the winter. And we had no idea what the hell we were getting into. You know, these are like, you know, three-day climbs. We didn't even have a bivy sack. And you know, it was, it was like, you know... Completely, you know, fortunate that we didn't actually freeze anything and didn't fall off. And um, somehow that should have cured me of that alpinism urge, but I guess it didn't. It just kind of got stronger. So, I mean, we were all like climbing was life. Life was climbing. Climbing was life at this time. And so it was like, I want to do the cool stuff. I want to do what other people are doing. It's the idea of what is possible. Back in the 1960s, climbing was still mostly dominated by an older generation of climbers. But as the 70s rolled around, a younger group of bold climbers emerged. The stone masters in Yosemite come to mind. But there was a young climber from the East Coast that had been turning heads, both on rock and in the mountains. His name was Johnny Waterman. Johnny cut his teeth at the Schwangunks in the 60s. So remember how I mentioned at the beginning of this episode that there was another John Waterman who would pop up in this story? Well, this is him. He's an author and climber who's written extensively about Alaska range climbing. And as you'll learn over the course of this story, he shares a strange, almost cosmic relationship with Johnny Waterman. He was really good in the mountains. Um, he was a good technical climber. He's more than good, he was great and he was bold. In the 1970s, the guy was a up-and-coming young Turk force to be reckoned with. Johnny had started climbing around the age of 13, cutting his teeth on the famous East Coast crags like the Shawangunks. Within a few short years, he'd established himself as something of a climbing prodigy. I mean, at a very young age, yeah, he was he got introduced to climbing, and at a very young age, was climbing, rock climbing pretty hard, got into alpinism very quickly, was the, again, the quintessential dirtbag. And I got introduced to him through his father, Guy Waterman, who was a member of the AMC New York chapter. And his dad was a brilliant speechwriter for, for General Electric Company and 
and also wrote speeches for three different presidents before they were in the White House and homesteaded in Vermont. And I knew his dad very well. His dad was also a pretty good climber himself. So when I first went up, my first rock climbing was, I think, the spring of 1970. Guy Waterman was one of the people I met who took me on one of my first climbs at the Gunks. And going up there on weekends, would climb with him occasionally. He'd take me climbing, is the way to say that. And I remember running, seeing his son Johnny once or twice. By this time, Johnny had already established himself as a competent mountaineer. In 1969, he climbed Denali's West Buttress as a 16-year-old. The next summer, he made his first attempt on Mount Hunter. And then after I came back from Knowles in the summer of uh, 71, did a few routes with Guy, and he just said, hey, you know, just with what you've done in the Wind Rivers and what you're excited by, my son Johnny, he's going to be in the Canadian Rockies coming from Alaska next summer and um, with a guy named Leif Patterson. And if you want to do something very cool, they're putting together a two-week expedition to uh, Mount Robeson. Peter jumped at the opportunity and with a few friends caught a train to the whistle stop at Mount Robeson Station. There, he met up with Johnny for two weeks, climbing a new route on Whitehorn as well as Robeson's cane face. I mean, he was just an awesome guy to be around. He had just come back from Alaska so he is the first guy I'm talking to spending two weeks on a big mountain. And he had just done the first ascent of the East Ridge of Mount Huntington with Rocky Keeler and some other like hot shit guys. And it was just awesome to be hearing these stories, staying in a tent and hanging out and climbing with the guy and hearing these stories. And just seeing how he climbed, the efficiency of how he climbed, the how light he climbed, just all of that. Peter was enthralled to be climbing with a kid like Johnny. But even then, there were warning signs of things to come. And you could also see some turbulent behavior in the guy even at that point in time. Just if something didn't go quite right, he was sort of an explosive personality. And then it calmed right down. Johnny was known for his eccentric behavior and sometimes explosive outbursts. But that didn't keep other hotshot climbers of the day from roping up with him. In addition to his climb on the East Ridge of Huntington in 1972, he began to turn his attention to another mountain, a mountain that in many ways would come to define his life. There were some real disappointments on two attempts on the South Ridge of Mount Hunter. On the first attempt in 1970, Johnny was only 17 years old. But even then, he was the driving force of the climb. Over the course of multiple weeks, the team flung themselves at the difficulties, only to be beaten back by a series of savage storms. When they retreated, Johnny vowed to return. After graduating from high school, Johnny traveled to England, Turkey, and the Alps to climb. In 1971, he briefly attended Western Washington University, but soon dropped out. Climbing had become his sole obsession. By 1973, Johnny returned to Mount Hunter with a team consisting of Dean Rao, Don Black, and Dave Carmen. Once again, they threw themselves at the South Ridge. They climbed an expedition style doing this really wild knife edge ridge of incredible cornicing and stuff called the Changabang Arette, right? I mean, just that name kind of evokes a, a fear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, this young guy, Johnny, gets back to town and he's staring at it from the river in Talkeetna. And he realizes that when they were climbing in a storm and they got to the summit, they had actually missed the summit by 200 feet. And he called that an utter failure, which to me, that's not an utter failure. You made a mistake. Like people will realize that, you know, you didn't not climb the 200 feet because you're lazy. Like you just couldn't see. But that nod and ate at him for years and years. And, you know, among many other things, I think that really developed with him this emotional cancer of Mount Hunter. During the 1973 Hunter trip, Johnny's partners noticed a shift. His explosive outbursts had become more frequent. 
his strange behaviors more apparent. The once careful climber seemed to be taking more risks, displaying the commitment of a samurai and an all-or-nothing attitude in the mountains. And I think that, you know, on that second climb, Johnny's outbursts began to ostracize him from his partners. He wasn't being careful. He was on the edge, just going for it obsessively. The guy that was you know, had been so safe and enthusiastic in the past that at one point he rappelled off of a snow picket and the picket pulled out and one of his partners actually held the rope while Johnny finished the rappel. So that kind of thing was becoming increasingly common. And I think that it's easy to see that he was no longer getting along. Despite the cracks showing in Johnny's personality and his relationships with others, his connection to Alaska had never been stronger. I think that, like many people, like myself, he was just enchanted with, you know, the beauty and the grandeur of not only the mountains, but Alaska itself. It really, for the right person, it is a hook. By 1973, Johnny was living full-time in Alaska. He shared a cabin with his older brother Bill in the interior city of Fairbanks. There was also a thriving scene of climbers living in Fairbanks, including a young prolific alpinist named Carl Tobin. He and Johnny ran in the same circle. Here's Carl from a 2016 interview. Well, he was intense. He was um, was a very intense guy, very organized, uh, you know, uh, meticulous, uh, you know, uh, almost to a fault sometimes, not seeing the forest for the trees. He, He was that way. By all accounts, Johnny was well-known among the small, tight-knit group of climbers in Fairbanks. But notoriety didn't equate to meaningful relationships. His behaviors were becoming increasingly eccentric. He drank bottles of salad dressing, walked around town strumming an out-of-tune guitar, and went for sub-zero winter runs donning mountaineering boots and crampons. But if these antics alienated him from others, He at least had his older brother, Bill. Bill was a couple years older than Johnny and was a climber, but was not as passionate about it, was not committed to a life of climbing as Johnny was. And he lost his leg uh, while in the midst of hopping freights outside of Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, His whole lower leg was amputated. Even with his physical limitations, Bill stayed active. Sometime around 1973, he traveled back east to spend some time rock climbing with his family. But what happened next would shock the Watermans. Shortly thereafter, the last that the family heard from him, that his father heard from him, was about 1973. And it was a mysterious sort of farewell that he was going away. And uh, they never heard from him again. Guy, his Johnny and Bill's father, assumed that he uh, would eventually get back in touch. So how this affected Johnny, I don't really know. Maybe Johnny, too, assumed that Bill would just reappear again. But uh, I think as the years went by, and as Johnny began to sort of become more and more detached, he probably believed that his brother was dead as well. You know, one can only speculate how Bill's disappearance might have affected Johnny, but one thing is certain, Johnny was changing. Around Fairbanks, his behavior continued to be erratic and impulsive, his outbursts with partners continued, and more and more he was isolating himself in the dark Fairbanks winters. So were you and Johnny, like, were you guys close friends? Uh, you know, uh, did Johnny have any close friends? Uh... We didn't socialize particularly together. If that's the case, you know, I I would see him often though and I would, we would visit each other some. But yeah, Johnny was, he was a different person. Um, Yeah, way different uh, person. And I think after 75, that's maybe the last time he climbed with anyone. So Clint, tell me about Mount Hunter's Southeast Spur. 
it's just this iconic route. You can't help staring at it from Talkeetna and the spur just rips down from the south summit of Mount Hunter and you just can't help but stare at it. It's just this iconic blade separating parts of the glacier and it's easy to see why it would be so appealing from far away. What about you, John? Anything to add? There's seldom climbers on it because it's very committing. It's not the kind of route that people are apt to go tackle because it involves so much time to get across this long, horizontal, double corniced ridge. If you were on that route and you got a snowstorm, you would be in a hell of a pickle because um, the route already has this double cornicing on it and then it, uh, it w- laden with snow uh, becomes that kind of place becomes really tricky. And these are the kind of routes that were done in the 1970s throughout Alaska and the Yukon Territories and the St. Elias Range, for instance, the Alaska Ranges. Um, But they aren't really done anymore uh, just because they're dangerous. They're just straight out dangerous, the double cornicing. There's an objective danger there that most climbers wisely, um, they go look for things that are more aesthetic and direct, like the Cassin. Having climbed Hunter's South Ridge in 1973, albeit not to the true summit, Johnny certainly would have known about Hunter's Southeast Spur. But there was another young alpinist who also had his eye on that route. Here's Peter Metcalf. The origin story of that specific route was I was in Alaska in 75, and the one thing I observed on a clear day in Talkeetna If you got a clear day and you walk down to Susitna River to take a piss or just to take a look at things, there you see the big three. There's Forker, Hunter, and McKinley. And in plain view is this unbelievable south face with that central rib coming right down it. And I just went slack jaw looking at it, asking everybody, like, well, what is that? I mean, it's Hunter. Like, has that route been done? I was just enthralled by it, and that was in 75. Peter started researching the line, and back then, the person to talk to about all things Alaska Range was Bradford Washburn. I'm going up to see Washburn up at the Boston Museum of Science to get some photos, um, spend some time with him, and start delving into it and thinking, okay, we've got to climb this thing. This is going to be so cool, because I'd done a couple other trips to Alaska, first ascents, and thought, all right, I'm ready for this guy. So in 1977... Peter set out with a team of climbers to give the Southeast Spur a try, and it didn't turn out so great. We went up there, drove up from Yosemite, the Tetons. Anyway, it it failed for reasons of the wrong party, the wrong approach, lack of experience. You know, maybe I'd I'd had a couple expeditions to Alaska, but they were expedition style or capsule style, not like this. Hence, coming back, I understood that One's got to do this thing, truly, it's got to be Alpine style. Fresh off his Southeast Spur attempt, Peter was already hatching plans to return to Hunter in the future. But he wasn't the only one. Back in Fairbanks, Johnny was charting his own course for an attempt on the Southeast Spur. But Johnny was battling demons. In addition to the unresolved nature of his brother Bill's disappearance, for years, Johnny had been experiencing a string of tragedies involving friends, mentors, and climbing partners. Well, one of the first deaths that must have really hit him hard was that of uh, Howie Davis. And this was a friend whom he climbed with in the gunks in New York. And they could be seen skipping down the carriage road en route to another climb, doing handstands and cartwheels. They were both very gymnastic, particularly Howie. But Howie uh, was spurned in a love affair and committed suicide by jumping off of a climb there. Of course, died uh, when he hit the ground. And of course, you know, that would have wrecked Johnny as his, you know, principal climbing partner. Then there was the famous Boyd Everett, who was the master expedition planner in Alaska. He wrote the little booklet called The Organization of an Alaskan Expedition, and had already done many Alaskan climbs. And he saw this great potential in Johnny there at the the gunks and kind of took him under his wing and would drive him to the cliffs. 
And one of the first people, I think the first person that Johnny tied in with was another protege of Everett's. Uh, his name was Dave Seidman. He was a gifted rock climber and all around mountaineer who I believe Johnny had gone with him to the West Buttress in Denali. And uh, Boyd Everett and Dave Seidman were both killed in an avalanche on Dalagiri along with five others. And it continued as Johnny continued climbing more and more uh, friends, and particularly mentors, began to drop off. Chuck Lokes, who uh, fell in the Tetons and was killed, and Ed Nestor, the very safe Ed Nestor, was killed. Rocky Keeler, who Johnny did the first ascent of the East Ridge of Huntington with, was killed in a bicycle accident. And by my count, there were nine different people who Johnny was inspired by and had climbed with. And Leif Patterson is another of the Canadian climber where Johnny often stayed. And uh, all these guys died as Johnny was beginning to cut his teeth as an alpinist. So at the same time, Johnny must have wondered about his brother Bill, which would have been, if Johnny really believed that Bill was dead, that would have been number 10 on the list. So. Um, most climbers, serious climbers, have a couple, maybe even three or four friends that die, but 10. That really took a toll on Johnny. By the end of 1977, Johnny's course for the Southeast Spur was set. He headed down to the village of Talkeetna, the launch point for his expedition, to continue his preparations. Now, Talkeetna in the dead of winter in the late 1970s, it was probably pretty grim, with even the most grizzled Alaskans driven to heavy drinking and dark bouts of depression. But even then, Johnny's behaviors stood out like a sore thumb. Here's longtime Talkeetna climber and local Lance Leslie. You know, he'd, he'd been in town for some time leading up to that climb. Uh, during the winter, my wife at the time was working at the uh, Talkeet Inn, the teepee at the time, and Johnny came in and rented a room in the hotel. So he was hanging out, he was staying in the room. He kept coming over and getting buckets of ice from the ice machine and sort of, you know, would, would go on at night. And he'd come and get just, you know, a bunch of these buckets of ice until the owner was like, what, what are you doing with all the ice? You're using all the ice. What, <laughs> what do you possibly be? You're not making drinks over there. What are you doing? And then come to find he was filling the bathtub with ice and just laying in there and getting his body temperature down and try, you know, and, and training his body for the cold. And then I'd see him out jogging on the, on the, on the road in his bunny boots. He'd be jogging in bunny boots with like a full pack on. So he'd jogging with a full pack on. So yeah, so he got kicked out of the teepee because of doing that. And then he, then he wound up staying over with uh, in a little shack on the village airstrip that was owned by uh, the pilot Cliff Hudson. And, and, Cliff, and Cliff was another guy who completely took Johnny under his wing. He, he was staying in the cabin and, and Cliff was, you know, finding gear for him and stuff. And he had, I mean, and when I say gear, he just had this hodgepodge of climbing gear and clothes and patched up stuff that was, you know, I mean, everything was wool, um, you know, just really old retro gear and bunny boots. I mean, he did most of that insane technical climbing in bunny boots, you know, with, with 12 point crampon strap, but I mean, incredible, you know? Yeah. So he had up this giant mountain of gear and he would, he would just literally sort this gear for weeks, for weeks he sorted gear. And, and would throw stuff out and go get it, put it back in until he had this insane pile of gear that was, I mean, hundreds of pounds. And I think he did trim it down to several hundred pounds, but it was just an insane amount of no, nothing lightweight, just everything, you know, like heavy, heavy camping type gear, you know. It's hard to know exactly what motivated Johnny to attempt Mount Hunter's Southeast Spur alone. But in March 1978, pilot Cliff Hudson flew him into the base of the route, armed with hundreds of pounds of gear, including a typewriter, a small desk, and weeks worth of food and fuel. Some have speculated that Johnny had a death wish, while others have proposed the mountains are where he felt the most alive. What is certain is that what followed was one of the most extraordinary, yet strange mountaineering feats of all time. Again, here's Clint Helander. When you read his 1979 American Alpine Journal entry on that climb, you can get a little bit of a 
insight into his mind. And I think he spiraled quite a bit further after that climb. But he talked about these things like his vendetta with Mount Hunter. And he named features like the judge, right? So he's up there on this mountain feeling like he's being judged by the mountain, maybe by society. You know, as, as he wrote in his account, he almost saw that climb as like a doing battle with some sort of, of some sort of living entity. Despite his decision to climb Hunter Solo, Johnny later reported feeling incredible bouts of desperation and loneliness. And just as it was in the city, Johnny's behaviors on the climb were explosive and erratic. Dropping acid along the way, asking uh, his bush pilot Cliff Hudson to drop off some medication because he had crabs, for instance, and he was being driven crazy by itching. He had somehow gotten crab lice from some pants that he had gotten from a dumpster. And he was radioing back to Cliff. He had a giant CB radio up there, of course, tons of batteries. So he was always calling Cliff Hudson for something, you know, make sure to drop me off more food or drop me off more fuel. And saying, can you drop me off like some, some lice medication? So like, they're infesting me. This, this whole, this whole you know, sleeping bag, his clothes were infested with lice. He brought only 3,600 feet of rope. Only? <laughs> which which sounds, yeah. <laughs> um, but when you think about climbing expedition style, like some of these people would, would fix miles and miles and miles of rope. But he, he climbed in this kind of capsule style and he would make 12 carries per camp. It took him six camps to reach the south um, summit. And I did the math. He moved the equivalent of... 259,000 feet, both hauling and climbing, because he would do 12 carries per camp, six camps to the summit, and then that doesn't even include getting all the way off the mountain. That's almost 49 miles. For weeks, Johnny made his way up the southeast spur. At one point, he collapsed a cornice and fell 40 feet, only to be saved by his self-belay system. By the time he reached the massive summit plateau, even Johnny was surprised to be alive. Meanwhile, Johnny's friend and Talkeetna local, Lance Leslie, was making an alpine-style ascent of Mount Hunter's West Ridge. Of course, Lance was fully aware of Johnny's protracted siege on the Southeast Spur, so he wasn't surprised to run into him near the summit. I could see his camp way over towards the south side. So we started to just kind of make a little detour over towards that. And I knew it was Johnny there. And he came running across the plateau completely unroped, you know, <laughs> many, many hundreds of yards to meet us. And he was just sort of just fried. He was fried and kind of manic and been hanging out there for a long time and waiting to go to the summit until the time was right. Although there had been lots of great weather. So uh, we went back to his camp. He made us peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We sat around for a little bit and talked. And he was just sort of rattling on a mile a minute. I, I don't even remember what we talked about. But he was you know, telling us about the route and everything. And you know, we said, well, we've got to press on, man. we got to make the summit and get, get down to our camp. Made the summit and went down. And then it was still many weeks until he finally got back to town. So, John... Looking back at Johnny's solo of the Southeast Spur, like, what do you think the climbing world's reaction was? I think it blew everyone's minds because of the amount of time that he was alone out there. You know, it's one thing today to go and solo the Cassin quickly, but to do what Johnny did was just, um, it's unfathomable. You know, it's like skiing to the South Pole or something. It, not even it's, it was a longer commitment than that. You know, there's a good chance that he he would not come back from that climb. Here's Pete Athens. When I heard about the the solo, I thought that you know, this was just a, a any an incredible length of time to be out completely solo. You know, fixing miles of rope, just you know, systematically moving up the mountain with, uh, as I recall, and, and my memory is not good. Um, that he had a piece of furniture with him, like a desk so he could write on or, but uh, just uh, an incredibly both eccentric, but remarkably innovative, uh, adaptive, uh, resilient and gritty personality. And here's Glenn Randall. I, I was completely flabbergasted. I mean, that's the longest solo 
first ascent I've ever heard of, probably by an order of magnitude. I mean, I don't, I don't know of anything that'd even be remotely comparable in terms of a solo first ascent. But uh, yeah, and just a lot of wonderment. You know, what what could possibly have driven him to do this, this climb? For climber Peter Metcalf, his reaction to Johnny Solo, it was mixed. It was a combination of feelings because I had gone to try that route the first time was in 1977. So when I learned of Johnny's climb, it was a combination of like disappointment that the route had been climbed. And then as soon as I read, read into it, it's like, oh, my God, he spent half a year on that fixing ropes, removing the ropes. And I thought, you know what? That route still deserves an alpine style ascent. As bold, impressive, or even harebrained Johnny Solo was, spending 145 days alone on Mount Hunter, it must have taken a toll physically and emotionally. I think he spent a hell of a lot of time just ensconced in snow caves waiting out bad weather, which is, you know, that in itself is, you know, must have just been a a huge burden to his sanity, you know, uh, just being alone, wondering if he's going to make it out alive, uh, stuck in a snow cave for days on end. After the climb, Johnny could have descended to the crowded Cahiltna base camp where he surely would have received a hero's welcome. Instead, he dropped down to the remote Tokositna glacier where he quietly nursed his frostbitten fingers. When he finally returned to Talkeetna, he borrowed $20 from Cliff Hudson and headed back to Fairbanks, where he found work as a dishwasher. You know, for him to come off of this 145-day climb and then go back to Fairbanks and work as a dishwasher with nobody knowing or really caring what he did in that society would have had to have been a total mindfuck. I think that Hunter climb may be... I don't know, maybe it kind of broke something in him a little bit. If Johnny's behaviors were seen as strange before the Hunter climb, well, they escalated to new heights upon his return to Fairbanks. Yeah, when he got back from that, you know, he was he was definitely a little fried. Maybe maybe that's when he really started taking the acid. I don't know. He was an iconoclast, and, you know, he ran a campaign on the University of Alaska Fairbanks campus uh, for president, for president of the U.S., and just had all these crazy ideas. He just got weirder and weirder. That's when he started wearing the cape. By this time, Johnny was strolling through Fairbanks wearing a cape and a glittery silver star glued between his glasses. Although most people laughed at his presidential ambitions, Johnny was dead serious about the whole affair. Sort of these grandiose plans. He was going to, you know, run for president on the Feed the Hungry Party. He was going to walk from Cook Inlet in the winter and go all the way to the summit of McKinley by himself. You know, just on and on and on. He'd show up in town. He was, you know, running for president. And people up in Fairbanks had even thought he was pretty weird. Um, uh, so, I, so I think there was, <coughs> excuse me, just a, you know, definitely a, a trend in his, uh, in his, you know, perhaps his mental decline after that climb. I think that climb on Hunter didn't help things. I think that it just showed him that what he could do and what he could do by himself without reliance on friends or teammates. And, and that just sent him to the edge of the diving board, I think. While Johnny's life continued to spiral in the dark Fairbanks winter of 1978 and 1979, a trio of motivated young climbers had their eye on Mount Hunter's southeast spur. But where Johnny had spent 145 days soloing the mountain, they wanted to do it in a week. Here's Peter Metcalf. You know, back at that time, there have been very few routes that had been big technical routes done alpine style in Alaska yet. People don't have to appreciate that. So there was sort of that breakthrough to do that. And then it was an understanding for me that, wow, okay, I've done a lot of, with Glenn and Pete, a lot of technical vertical waterfall ice. Feel pretty good about that and feel really good about my rock climbing and walls. 
I've been to Alaska numerous times, but you know what? I've never combined them all, which is I got to do technical mixed roots and big roots with a pack on my back that are multi-day just to feel what that's really about and get comfortable with it. So that was when it hit me. I, I got to go to the Alps for a season or two and just start doing the North Walls, like the Orca Spur and the Eckfiler and things like that. And so that was the plan, which is what happened was, okay, two, two seasons of doing that with different buddies and then a recognition too that it had to be the right team. And so when coming back from the Alps in the fall of 79, it was, okay, it's time back to Boulder, gonna do this and who's the team? and recruited both Pete and Glenn. I had been to Alaska once before, 1978, and done a new route on Mount Huntington. And the, the driving force behind that one was a guy named Angus Thurmer who had gotten some new photos from Washburn of the south side of Mount Huntington and noticed there was this unclimbed spur and recruited me and a couple other guys, and we went up there and fortunately got up it. So I did have a little bit of Alaskan experience. So I had some idea of the scale and the difficulties and the weather and stuff. I had never been to Alaska, so I I had always wanted to go. Um, I I was you know enthralled by the literature of the time. Loved the idea of uh, of going up on a big mountain. Was a big fan of Robert Service um, and the history of of uh, gold mining and all of that stuff. So the romance was pretty thick and deep. But, um, you know, obviously I was I was also, I, I think at the time, thinking, am I am I up for, you know, what's going to be a, a mirror of this mountain showing me, you know, the skills that I have? Are they are they adequate or is it going to show me that I'm really woefully underprepared? The team started planning their climb. If it took Johnny Waterman 145 days to solo and traverse the mountain, how long would it take for a trio of young guns to do it in Alpine style? In 1979, this wasn't unknown. I really began to work on the food, what kind of gear did we need, how much stuff, how much gear could we actually climb with and do this, and what did you need to survive on a route like that? You know, overanalyzing, you know, shaving ounces off the Logan bread rations, figuring out what we were going to put in the Gorp mix. I mean, really, a lot of the the sub-atomizing of, of how we were going to do this, the equipment we would need. You know, do you need tents or do you not? Can you just hack a snow cave and a, stay on a ledge? Can you do open divvies? How do you do it? But then, you know, obviously the appreciation for the fact that we were stepping into the unknown on, on a lot of parts of this this climb, whether we could endure the, the duration that it would require, whether we were going to be fortunate enough with the weather, just so many unknowns that over which we had absolutely no control. So we did drill down on the things we could control, our gear and our rations. Made a bunch of decisions on it, and these guys went along with it. And some of them were really dumb. I mean, one of them was like, okay, did the walker spur in two days? That's like 3,500 feet. Did that in mixed conditions, all with crampons on? This is twice the size. Double that, like you had two days worth of fudge. It's a week. Do this route in a week, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, that's that's more than you were asking, but that's the, the origin story of getting to Hunter. As Peter Metcalf, Glenn Randall, and Pete Athens planned their alpine-style attempt on the Southeast Spur back in Alaska, Johnny continued his downward spiral. In December 1979, he flew into the Kahiltna Glacier intent on making a winter solo ascent on Denali's south face. But December and January are the cruelest winter months. After 10 days, Johnny implored his pilot to pick him up, stating, quote, Take me home. I don't want to die. Then, a few months later, as Johnny lingered around Talkeetna, disaster struck. One of the things that people uh, credit that really, really sent him spiraling was when he got down from Hunter and was preparing to go do this solo of Denali, he had all of his writings and everything he owned in this cabin in Talkeetna. He was living in a cabin back behind the, uh, the 76 station, Black, Black John's cabin as it was called. 
named after an old miner who, who lived there. And uh, he came over one, it wasn't at night, it was during the day, to the 76 station and asked Rose if he could borrow the hose. Rose Jenny, she and her husband owned the Union 76 station that had the local laundromat. They also owned the cabin where Johnny was staying. And she said, no, the hose isn't even hooked up. It's winter, it'll freeze, so we don't hook it up in the winter. And he's like, well, do you, do you have a bucket for water or something? Like, well, like, what do you want water for? He didn't say anything. He just hung around for a while, and then he's like, you know, ask her for the hose again. She was like, no, John, we just don't have a, don't have a hose for you. What, what do you want a hose for? And, he's like, and he, he, just, he sat down and have a cup of coffee, and he's like, well, the cabin's on fire. And sure enough, the cabin was on fire and it burnt most of the cabin to the ground. And everything he had written, which, you know, he was, I don't know what you call it, but he basically wrote down everything, like what he ate, every climb he did, all of his thoughts. And it's kind of like when all of those notes and everything burned up, his life burned up with it. As I think that incident was a real, a real breaking point for him. Whether Johnny was simply odd or spiraling deeper into mental illness, the cabin fire was a turning point in his life. The next day, Johnny made his way to Anchorage where he checked himself into the Alaska Psychiatric Institute. But two weeks later, perhaps fearing they might never let him go, he checked himself back out. Within weeks, he was planning his next Denali climb, this one more extreme than the last. Back in Boulder, Peter Metcalf, Glenn Randall, and Pete Athens were continuing preparations for their upcoming Southeast Spur attempt. Although they would attempt to climb in a polar opposite style than Johnny Waterman, they still had respect for what he'd done. What Johnny did is a testament to human tenacity, perseverance, masochism, and eccentricness, but nobody's going to want to emulate that. That's not the future climbing. But to do that route alpine style and go for it, like it's still a worthwhile objective. So we got to go for it and see what that climb is really all about. I knew I had, you know, two great partners. You know, I had climbed with Peter a bunch um, in various places. I climbed with Glenn in Boulder. Knew, knew Glenn to be a superb technical climber. Um, you know, both of these guys on, on rock and on ice far better than me. And I felt confident about, about the team. I probably didn't know as much about it as I would want to know now if anybody proposed something like that. We just loved being in the mountains. And we wanted to try to take some of these newfound skills and try to push ourselves. And we were inspired by the Swiss and of course the English and the people who were putting up the big climbs on on the the big faces in Europe, um, and and I stupidly thought that if I if I was fit enough to do a couple of those climbs back to back, I probably could climb Mount Hunter. Next time on Ridge of Madness, it's amazing what powerful emotions like anger and rage and loneliness or depression or whatever can do in in a creative pursuit you know we we definitely were were kind of running on empty we were so low on gear at that point we were all just basically soloing but we were still tied together so any one mistake would probably have cleaned all three of us off the route you literally had to be crazy to attempt something like that alone we knew that he had gone up up the northeast fork and we completed our climb and flew out and then you know hey, hey what happened to john we asked Doug, he's like, I don't know. How far can we get to experience life at its absolute fullest? The Fernline is written and produced by me, Evan Phillips. A huge thank you to Clint, John, Pete, Glenn, Peter, Lance, and Carl. This story couldn't be told without the incredible writings of Glenn Randall and John Waterman. Glenn's book, Breaking Point, is a mountaineering classic that's out of print, but if you do a little digging, you could probably find a copy. John's book, In the Shadow of Denali, is one of my favorite books of all time. His story, Lone Wolf, The Other John Waterman, has been a guide in creating this story. A huge thank you to both Glenn and John for their inspiring works. 
Music today is curated by Artlist and Epidemic Sound. If you enjoy the Fernline, consider becoming a member on Patreon. You can subscribe at patreon.com slash the Fernline or find a link at thefernline.com. Finally, a thank you to our season six sponsors, Alaska Rock Gym and The Hoarding Marmot. Make sure and tune in next week for part two of Ridge of Madness. <laughs>